It's the big middle again with me, Susan Flory, and I want to ask you, do you think you can harm yourself by eating too much spinach? You know, that superfood that we all know and love and probably eat a lot of. And what about almonds? Are you always doing that thing that nutritionists suggest? Pack a few almonds to tide you over, prime your metabolic pump, uh, all of that. Well, both are high in something called oxalates. They're super high in these oxalates. Now, if you're not rolling your eyes and saying, no, Susan, I don't want to hear any more what I can't eat. I'm already struggling to figure out the matrix, the industrial food matrix and what's healthy and what's not. Well, this conversation is going to make you think again. I've got Sally K. Norton for you. Hello, Sally. Hello. Nice to see you, Susan. Nice to see you. And I am so psyched for this conversation. You are the go-to person for this nutrition, nutritionist, public health leader. You've got a master's in public health, as well as your bachelor's degree in nutrition. And you have devoted your life to spreading the news about oxalates. And I quizzed my friends, as I always do before podcasts, and they said, the what? You mean oxalis? And I, yes, that's one of my favorite plants, but oxalates, nobody's talking about them. Everybody's just talking about the vitamin K and the vitamin C and how many handfuls of spinach to put in that Nutribullet of a day for your green smoothie. Now, why are oxalates and spinach being chief among them may be dangerous for not all of us, but some of us? Well, it's a fundamental toxin, and you're right to bring up oxalis, the plant. That's its namesake, because oxalate, oxalic acid, was originally a plant extract coming from plants that make a lot of oxalate, which sorrel and oxalis are. Uh, and we've been using it for industrial purposes since the 1700s, cleaning, bleaching, removing stains, removing rust. Like It's very uh, useful as a reactive acid that grabs minerals, and that's not so good for bodies. Okay. Is that the sole source of it, the oxalis plant, which is gorgeous and purple and well, they has delightful little flowers? It. They synthesize it artificially now, and it's um, a huge industrial product. It's used a lot still in all forms of industry. So it's a major, you know, it's used not only in industry for all those cleaning things, it's also used in science is a reagent for doing studies to see where calcium goes in cells to study what's what's going on with cells we use it when we test for blood glucose levels so if you've ever had a blood draw yeah. and they're testing your blood glucose level the tube that they're putting your blood in has oxalate oxalic acid in the tube that's because it shuts down the metabolism of the cells in your blood so therefore, they won't use the glucose. You have to freeze the moment in time, how much glucose was in your blood when you drew it. But if you left those cells in there for any amount of time, they would just continue to use the glucose for energy and you wouldn't be able to measure the glucose. But if you kill the cell's ability to use energy, then you preserve that glucose level. And that's one of many things oxalate's doing to you. It's killing your energy metabolism. Well, let's get back to the spinach, though, because we need to know why is spinach such a defensive plant? Why, why would you think it would have such high oxalate content? Well, this is a question for botanists, but I can tell you that many, many plants are high in oxalate and the ones that are super, super high are considered completely poisonous. And somehow spinach has slipped under the radar, which was a mistake that was made in the 1930s when we first discovered that feeding spinach to infants and children cause a devastating calcium deficiency in them. Um, but we decided to give a pass on spinach so we could just generally promote leafy greens because maybe they have vitamin A, which they don't technically have vitamin A. And maybe they have other good stuff. And we've been using that same excuse since 1935 to justify a high oxalate food like spinach. And now we have this big theory about phytonutrients, which is another failed theory. 20, 40 years ago, we started to think of these compounds and plants as antioxidants, when in fact, like oxalate, they're pro-oxidant molecules. Unlike oxalate, they may have the ability to turn on your defensive chemicals in yourself and get your own innate ability to produce glutathione and, and antioxidants in your body up. So it looks like you get an antioxidant effect from them, but it's clear that you really don't. So there's just so much confusion on the basic principles that we're thinking of. And you could back off and just think, 
well, hey, what if you eat a cleaning chemical every day, three days a day for years and years? Is that really okay to do? And it's not some people are vulnerable to it. It's the toxin. It's the level of your vulnerability. Like how much does it take to knock you down, knock you flat, to give you osteoporosis or arthritis or almost anything we consider old age dementia? So it affects us all in the same way. If we have an overload, I want to hear your story in a minute, like Liam Hemsworth had. I mean, we can thank him a lot because he's a screen star. And of course, when he opens his mouth about anything, people listen. <laughs> it's our culture. Okay. Um, but he had, no, he had, um, kidney stones and put out his own health warning about I've been having too many handfuls of spinach and everything in almond milk and almonds. And you can tell his story better than I can. What happened with Liam Hemsworth? Well, he, you know, like everyone who's trying to do the right thing, he adopted this more plant-based and he became fully vegan. Uh, his wife at the time was a vegan too, and they were in on the cool thing to do. And that included the superfood spinach smoothie. He says he was putting five handfuls of spinach in the smoothie each time. And he's a big guy and having more than one smoothie a day, no doubt. And it got to the point where he was, he needed surgery in a very unfortunate timing. He missed a, an awards banquet. He missed the premiere to his movie because he was in the hospital suffering greatly and needing kidney surgery for this kidney stone. And he, he didn't really get the greatest answers from his doctors. So he had to think more deeply about what happened to him. And he was able to put together the fact that the spinach was the source of the substrate that it makes up a kidney stone. You see kidney stones, 80% of all kidney stones are principally made of oxalate, but it's calcium oxalate. And the doctor often tells you, you have a calcium stone and they fail to mention that it's actually oxalate that's the main ingredient. <laughs> calcium by itself can't become a stone without something like oxalate to turn it into these crystals. So oxalic acid turns into crystals. It likes to grab calcium. When you're taking rust off your patio or off your engine, it's grabbing iron and it can grab other minerals as well. This is a bad thing in your body because minerals are cofactors to enzymes and your enzymes start to not work like Nella enzymes is what runs life itself. So he had the surgery and was there any sort of follow-up? Is he now proclaiming that it was the spinach all along and I'm so much better? And because we, I haven't heard health, much. Both Men's Health Australia and Men's Health US both put out... Um, aspects of his of his story that may have been told in the same interview i'm not sure how that all played out but he he made it clear that he needed to change his diet and completely rethink what he thought of as a healthy diet but he also said you know what you just have to kind of do your thing and then figure it out later he he didn't quite catch on to the idea that his story is really a universal story now it just he his vulnerability was kidney stones if we do that high oxalate eating day in and day out, it will catch up with us at some point. Luckily, it caught up soon enough that he could, in a way that really grabs your attention. I mean, it wrecked some important events in his life. That'll get your attention. Something you suddenly put your foot down. I don't want this to happen ever again. You know, when you take the time to figure it out and he was able to, which is amazing because people are completely unaware of oxal oxalate, oxalic acid in our foods and its connection to disease. Yeah, as you say, it's become a classic scenario where people take in all the messages, the, the messages that, that are now predominant, where plants, 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 don't eat any meat, and people are chucking in bagfuls of spinach and all kinds of other oxalates, almond milk, almond flour, um, everything else. I know you're going to give us the list at some point and they're causing health problems and not realizing it. And then they're saying, okay, well, I was vegetarian. I was vegan like you and I, I know we can talk about that in a minute. So what are you seeing out there? Is your message getting out to more and more people because you're, you're on the circuit now, you're on lots of podcasts, you're doing mainstream interviews. Are you getting attention and the attention you think oxalates, the danger of oxalates deserves? Well, we're still in early days. That really what I, where I start from and I continue to reside in the idea that people who are in trouble with their health can't piece this together. You cannot tell that you just ate this high oxalate food and that's really your, the source of your trouble. It's very hard to figure this out from just kind of watching your lifestyle and figuring out what should I change so I can sleep better, or my elbow quits hurting or my 
stomach quits hurting or my, you know, why did I, the healthy person get osteopenia? Like, well, how could that be? I've done everything right. You know, so if you've done everything right, it, you may be like putzing out and things start falling apart and you're looking for answers. And those are the people I'm here for. I'm here as a little SOS. Hey guys, <laughs> it might just be your healthy diet and no one's warning you of that. So I really felt obligated with my background and my lifelong intention to help people not be sick. Like the mainstream messages are making people sick. Just like the mainstream messages coming from my profession in public health, public health nutrition has allowed for an obesity epidemic and a diabetes yeah. epidemic to explode across the globe because we had this bright idea that animal fat was bad and therefore carbs are fine. And, and we really like spawned the whole, what I call the snack wells phenomenon where you can buy yes. an endless tower of things that have labels to say, I'm low sugar, I'm no cholesterol, I'm this, I'm that. And it gave people permission to start living on processed junk food. And we think of yeah. processed junk food as our main nemesis. And if we don't eat that, if we eat whole foods, we're fine. That turns out to be another lie. Really, I've disturbing. done so many podcasts of, of really amplifying that message, hyperpalatable foods that are playing with your brain, that are making you addicted in our obesogenic environment. I mean, it's it's terrible what we've done. I was reading an article just this morning, Sally, and it was I had the fact in 422 million diabetics around the world draining governmental health budgets, national health budgets by at least 10%. And the the rate of diabetes for kids is magnitude of three. For adults, it's one in four. I mean, it's it's absolutely crazy. And everyone's saying, oh, don't worry, just count the calories, get to, get yourself down to the gym more, push away from the pies. It's not working, folks. So there are other factors that are making us all sick. And oxalates is one of them. It, and it's not getting as much attention. I mean, even just my, my straw poll. Um, everyone said, what? No. What are you talking no. about? No, nobody heard of it. People don't want to hear the oxalate message because it's, it's, it's like rubbing a cat the wrong way. I mean, you you are not allowed to say that spinach is bad because, yeah, hey, that's how you earn your dessert. You eat your greens and then you get to have your dessert. And that mentality that is so culturally ingrained, we can bribe children and bribe ourselves to eat vegetables that are supposedly so wonderful for us with a chocolate bar later. And after all, the chocolate's so good for us too. And the whole thing isn't based on anything real. You start getting into the actual science and getting into real lives. And you'll see that eventually this so-called healthy eating falls apart. It, it doesn't hold up to its, to its sales job. Yeah. We're, we're so brainwashed. And my, my, my brain, like yours, was washed and polished to a beautiful machine. Um, I remember when I sat down with Prof. Tim Noakes, he was, I thought, what is he on about? Because, you know, it's divided opinion. I think he's a legend. I hold him in really high esteem. And I was sitting down for a couple of interviews when I first started this podcast, um, when I was living in Cape Town. And long story short, he said, oh, but there's so many anti-nutrients in plants and he was saying how he was more and more moving away from plants and they were taking up, you know, uh, hardly any space on his plate. And I thought, oh, that's that's clearly not right. You know, but in my brainwashed mind, I wasn't even open to hearing that message. I just pushed it aside and carried on with the other things that I'd already accepted as being beneficial to our long-term health, looking back to animal proteins, the whole Ansel Keys story, all of that. And, and I know from listening to you, you were like me, you grew up zero fat. Anyway, I want to hear your story and how you, you ended up being on a road to a lot of physiological misery when you hit puberty, when you had problems with your feet, and then take us through how you ended up understanding that it could be all the vegetables I'm eating. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was it really into eating vegetables as a kid. I was already a gardener by age nine. And I, I, my mother used me as a tool to pick on the other children who were picky about vegetables and tools. Sally will eat it. Sally loves her beets and bean greens and vegetables and main dishes. And I would fill up on food. I've been a foodie, love to eat. As a kid, I, I didn't even have room for ice cream at the end. Let me go play. You know, I was, I've been into eating well. And my grandfather was a pastry chef from Europe and he has brought some amazing stuff to us to eat. And my mom cooked from scratch and we had gardening in the family and all that. And so 
I should have been a healthy kid because I, I was not allowed to have, we were only allowed to have soda pop on New Year's Eve. It was kids champagne. We weren't raised on sugar. When the ice cream man came down the street, we didn't get the nickel to go buy it. Like it this, I didn't, I mean, my Neither mom was did still I. doing. Nope, absolutely. The problem though, you know, is that whole, I grew up in the era where this processed food became it like post-World War II, we, we decided to make motherhood more convenient with coupons and teach moms who were had a small family budget to stretch the budget buying these new cereals and the hot dogs and this stuff that was all now available and being accepted, you know, through TV and marketing. But so, you know, I grew up with sort of standard, but but really in some ways much more food conscious and much more interested in vegetables. My dad loved his greens. He grew up on them, beet greens and Swiss chard. And by the time I was 12, I was having back pain and arthritis. And by the time I was 19, I had foot pain. And I ended up dropping out of Cornell where I was getting my nutrition degree for foot surgery. And that didn't really fix the problem. I had been needing wheelchairs to go to the major grocery store or go to like the anything that required walking I used crutches I had these Canadian crutches which are metal crutches with a forearm crutch you know I, I was on ibuprofen the doctor just put me on goo gobs of it for like five years the surgery was supposed to fix it and really didn't um and it wasn't really and so I mean I remained my feet remained problematic to the point where you know I was able to get off the orthotics and the painkillers. But I couldn't get out of shoes. Like I needed shoes to hold my feet together. I could not even stand barefoot at the kitchen without shoes on. So, so it was I needed... ibuprofen and surgery. Those were the, the options. Those and that's are the, the only options for medicine. That's it. Ibuprofen and surgery. And if those don't work, it's your fault. They, wow. they don't have anything else to offer you. And no one realizes that the structural integrity of your connective tissues that hold your feet together or the little broken bones on my feet could be from this malnutrition and toxic effects of eating a high oxalate diet. Oxalates break down connective tissue and give you weak connective tissue. They suck the minerals out of your system and give you weak bones. And your ability to repair tissue goes way down because the energetics of the cells, the cells have trouble making enough proteins to replicate themselves adequately. And you end up with chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation makes those connective tissues even more unhappy. They get kind of sticky and tight and you get tight fascia and weird joint stuff where you can be flexible, but tight. And it's just like strange things start happening in your teeth. You start getting teeth pain, you get cavities. You can get issues with your eyes and sinuses. You can get issues with chronic infection. I had a sinus infection every year, right around New Year's Eve from the age 17 on until I started this diet, just as I was turning 50. I finally- To 50? That. Yeah. So it took you 40 years, well, 30 years of your own detection, your own forensic digging to get to the answer that you've got now. So you had all this misery, foot pain, mobility issues, and all of these health, chronic pain. Right. Wow. Is, I needed a hysterectomy. I, I just, so many things, so many things. I like to not think about them. <laughs> I've never been one to focus on my ills because I'm a busy kind of, I would like to get stuff done person. So I just like push through and try to make stuff happen. And uh, I, really my entire, my career, I would probably have a PhD in a whole different career. Have I not been struggling with fatigue and pain and health problems my entire life. And now I feel so much better. In my thirties, I felt like I was 80. Now that I'm about to turn 60, I feel more like I'm 40. That's a way better math, it's yeah. way nicer. Yeah. And even you feel vital and healthy and it's because you've given up the oxalates or you only eat low oxalate food. So let's get back to the basics because I'm kind of getting ahead of, ahead of the basics spinach relative to not Swiss chard, because I know that your problem was you did at 50, you discovered by being in the library every Sunday, reading all of the medical literature that led you to these discoveries. And it was, you were mainlining sweet potatoes and Swiss chard. So take us through some of the problem oxalate foods, the one and turmeric and things like that, the foods and the spices that, and the values, the content that is problematic. Well, in the spice department, turmeric is the worst one. 
Cumin is not very good either. Cinnamon isn't great either, but there's two, there's multiple kinds of oxalate in foods. There's the oxalic acid that's free to float into your bloodstream. It just floats between the cells in the gut and gets into your blood. Then there's the crystals. So plants make oxalate crystals, calcium oxalate crystals. It helps the seeds, for example, um, store calcium and, and then calcium is available for later. It also creates a protective coating in plants, including in bark. So trees make calcium oxalate chunky blocks of oxalate, calcium oxalate crystals, which are very hard. They're harder than teeth. They wear your teeth down. And cinnamon is the tree bark. So the amount of the oxalate that's in cinnamon is principally the crystals. So the problem with cinnamon is it's going to be gritty on your teeth and it's going to irritate your gut. It's like eating sandpaper. In the glossies and from every orthodox nutritionist or dietitian, they fill Instagram with, with all of their advice and everyone laps it up and there are you know, 10,000 likes for someone saying how important turmeric is and cinnamon is anti-inflammatory. I mean, we just don't know. Our head's on a swivel. We don't know what to believe these days. Well, certainly people don't want to believe this because this seems like it's out of left field. And But we've been just drinking the Kool-Aid. And I think you said how, you know, it's easy to be in this brainwashed state when your mind is shut and you stop thinking. And that's happening to all human beings, whether they've got a PhD or not. It's happening on the scientist bench. It's happening with the review process. It's happening with the publication process. And it's happening in the funding process. So what we end up getting, which um, Nassim Tlaib is very good about saying this, and so have many others said this, um, about science is that it, if you get the expected result, it's less likely to be true. And the results that come forward in science that go against the grain are more likely to have truth in them. And yet our human tendency is to downplay and just explain away the, the things that don't fit our little models for how things work. And we're so busy wanting to believe in this model and perhaps because so much of our culture now is shaped by economic forces. And it, it, there's a lot of profitability in promoting products, promoting agriculture. Our, all of our economies originally were based on agriculture. In the US, the USDA is main job is to make sure our economy is strong. And so we wanna promote agricultural products. Anything that says don't buy, you don't need a buying solution for this is basically canceled under the contract of all things good must create cash flow. And, and sadly now, so we're settling for diagnostic testing and disease is a great way to boost GDP. Yes, no, absolutely. The public health system is crying out for a capital program, you know, someone who could control the messaging. But of course, that's not going to happen. The lentil lobby is, is holding sway at the moment and plants well, only. And in, in academia, we've been holding up with great esteem the idea of private public partnerships. So we want big private money to help fund our fancy new buildings in academia and our new research labs and our, and our certain uh, positions, you know, you can get a chair in XYZ. So you can get a Pfizer chair and something other. So that's helping to pay salaries, helping to keep the lights on, helping to keep the institution viable and competitive. You have to compete for grants and you have to look fancy. If you draw in more funding, you get more money. Money attracts money. So yeah. big money is privatized. So, and so what are we going to do? I mean, it's the way things work right now. And unfortunately, the consumer of this information has no way to really make sense of it. And for me to even make sense of the literature on oxalate, you have to read and read and read and read until you know when what you're reading is true or not. Like, because the researchers repeat wrong ideas over and over again as if they were ever proven true and ignore all the studies that proves that wrong. So you have to even know, you have to read enough in the medical research field to really know what the true story is. It's easy to cherry pick and say, oh, this study promotes my concept. I like to promote turmeric. This study says it's great. But if you really look at the, the real discussion among the researchers and they say, well, that's, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're getting false positives. The, the news that those positive results for turmeric say gets obliterated. And, and because it's it's cool to say we're, we're getting somewhere, we're gonna have a breakthrough somehow. 
Yeah. And it's going to be about selling more stuff, whether it's a new drug, a new product, a new extract, whatever. But causation is so hard to pinpoint, isn't it, when it comes to nutrition? Because a lot of the studies are epidemiological, they're nutrition Q&As. You know, it's people observing their own <laughs> eating habits and guessing at what they ate three years ago. As, as Jane Reese Buxton um, was telling me in our podcast, she's the author of The Plant-Based Con. And um, you got a big mention in her book, and that's where I discovered you. So the thing is, we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know so much, you know, about the biochemical reactions and what you're focusing on with the oxalates. I mean, tell us about the medical literature behind this, the science behind it that you're relying upon to, to be fully authentic with your message and having no qualms about spreading this. Because I can imagine a lot of people are listening right now and doing, as I said in the intro, that eye rolling maneuver and saying, Ugh, Susan's got a quack on the show. I mean, honestly, <laughs> because you are pushing against the perceived, accepted, wholesome superfood message. Well, it's very interesting because we we're discovering in real life where, you know, I had my health was terrible and then I went on this diet and I had a very bad sleep disorder, by the way. My brain was waking up 29 times an hour. And that was what really got me on this tear of like, I got to figure out what's wrong with me. And to, to have that suddenly disappear and my feet suddenly get better after 30 something years of bad feet. Now I can run barefoot. Like this is, you can't deny this. And then my osteopenia reversed itself and it's normal bone density now. And my arthritis went away and it just all kinds of stuff that happened to my teeth are much better. Like you cannot deny the solidness of my bones are better. My teeth are better. My sleep is better. My whole life is clearing up. So that's a case study, right? And then but I is there one, one scientific study, you know, we all love these randomized control trials yeah, that led so you RCT, down this path? The, the RCTs aren't done for oxalate, but what you see in the literature are a series of case reports on the genetic form of oxalate poisoning, where there's a very rare genetic disorder of what's called glyoxal um, metabolism in the liver, where the liver makes too much oxalate. That's very instructive about how bad it can get and, and all the tissues where oxalate ends up accumulating. And unfortunately, they're blaming the liver failure for the oxalate accumulation. This is one of those mythologies in science that you have to you have um, kidney failure for oxalate to start collecting. This is the big problem that's long-term. There's an acute toxicity after you eat the spinach smoothie that you don't see, that it's messing the mitochondria up in your immune cells. It's causing the immune cells in your bloodstream to be damaged and put out pro-inflammatory cytokines and distress signals. And then you have damaged immune cells trying to deal with infections and are not doing well, which is one of the reasons why chronic infections like my sinus infections or people who get urinary tract infections or yeast infections and so on chronically over and over and over again can be from a high oxalate diet because you're fundamentally damaging the immune cells. There's lots of places like that in the literature where a few studies have demonstrated this very solidly, but it's still considered preliminary in science when you just have you know three studies. You see the same thing with other effects from oxalate too, but especially in like the poisoning literature. You can poison yourself to death with oxalates using uh, antifreeze, which is ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol gets turned into oxalate in the body. Is those case studies are very instructive about how neurotoxic it is. And those folks, as the oxalate is formed in the body a week or so, two weeks after the poisoning, and then two weeks later, the body starts trying to release it. You get Bell's palsy and an inability to speak and all kinds, of, if the person survives it. Most people, I mean, I don't know what the what fraction, but many people who commit suicide with ethylene glycol succeed and they die. And what kills them is the oxalic, the oxalic acid forming in the body. They end up with a heart attack and liver or kidney failure and so on. And, and oftentimes you can create a stroke or this neuro palsy in the body. So you see it with ethylene glycol, you see it with other forms of what there is there called precursors. And you even see it in dietary oxalate where occasionally you see cases, older cases where rhubarb consumption or the leaf, rhubarb leaf consumption, rhubarb and rhubarb leaf is nearly deadly. It's so high in oxalate. If you were to eat it like you eat Swiss chard. Swiss chard is not as bad as rhubarb leaves. Um, but you, there's many places where these are technically case studies all over. And then you look at science mechanisms where you see these effects on the cells. And that's all over too, where you see many animal studies showing failure of the, the glands where oxalate causes hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, 
pink, you know, all the glands start misfunctioning and misfunctioning. tissues don't do so well. Can you back up because you've, you've just waved a little flag for me because I have Hashimoto's. I had a series of autoimmune attacks, uh, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. And I've, I've mentioned it so often on the podcast, I try to just skip across it, but at menopause and after 10 years as a vegetarian, and I mean, I must be half spinach at this point because that was my go-to thing. Any restaurant, big plate of spinach. I lived in Lyon and they were all eating steak tartare and blood sausage. And I was having my mountain of spinach and feeling really smug about it. So mm -hmm. I think I am fully half spinach. And maybe that's why I have, maybe that's why my systems are still not, not optimal, even though I pay so much attention and I'm become an omnivore and do loads of exercise and watch, watch, make sure that I don't have insulin resistance, you know, correct, 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 doing my own detective work. So with you, when you discovered that and you backed away from the oxalates, what did you have to give up? And let's get back to focusing on the values of oxalate, the content of oxalates in the spinach yeah, relative to the arugula, the what's good. Let's How much go oxalates do spinach have? But let's, this, since we're on the thyroid gland, this is really important little tiny pseudo, little tiny factoid of the fact that by the time you're 50, you have an 85% chance of having oxalate crystals in your thyroid gland. That's like kidney stones stuck in your thyroid gland. That definitely is affecting function. And it's this vicious cycle. Function goes down, crystals collect, crystals collect, function goes down. And you get antibodies eventually because you get this, what's called a granuloma type response to what's called a foreign body response. Like these particulates in your tissues are pollution. Barely irritating to the immune system. Who's like, what are we doing with this junk here? We got to get rid of it. So the immune system tries to either hide it so you don't react to it. So there's no symptoms or eventually tries to go after it. And that can create things like the Hashimoto's, which tends to go away. Um, but it takes a long time to clean up these tissues and the leftover damage and fibrosis and things left behind that scar tissue uh, can cause long-term problems. And that's the real thing. You don't want to wait until you've loaded up your body with accumulating crystals to correct the problem. The best answer is prevention. And you prevent it by knowing which high oxalate foods and how they really go way past your body's capacity to handle it. Our daily handling, if we have healthy gut, we have good kidneys, we can handle about 150 milligrams of oxalate a day. That's if you go and have a beaten quinoa salad plate, that's about 150 milligrams with one little tiny meal. Uh, spinach, your standard spinach smoothie is somewhere between 700 and 1,000 milligrams of oxalate, which your body can only handle an eighth of that. You're going and one spinach smoothie is overdoing. One salad is probably between 450 and. 500. I was stunned when I read that in your book. You said 722 milligrams, um, one cup of spinach. So let's talk in terms of cups or a handful of spinach. I mean, that, that's overloaded you immediately. And that's the definition of toxicity. You've, it's all about the dose. And we right now are really dosing heavily because we love spinach, bee greens, Swiss chard. Those are the worst ones of all. And then the almonds everywhere and the beets, the sweet potatoes. Then we've got the berries in the smoothies, the dark chocolate, the turmeric, these are all supposedly so great for us. And a lot of us grew up on French fries, tater chops, potato chips, all these potato products, very high in oxalate. Chocolate of all forms as a child, you know, it happens all the time. And then there's peanut butter and peanuts generally that, so you can be living on Pringles and peanut butter sandwiches and also poison yourself with oxalate. In both cases, the diets are very deficient in minerals. You end up eating a mineral deficient diet when you're eating junk food or healthy high oxalate foods. It doesn't matter that they're supposedly healthy if they're sucking the minerals out of your foods, out of your bloodstream, out of your bones. Your bones have to make up for the loss of calcium that occurs after you absorb oxalic acid. Remember, it's a cleaner that cleans you out of minerals. <laughs> You know, is this on a spectrum? Are some people actually impervious to the effect? So they've got iron, ironclad stomachs, or is this, I mean, earlier you called me on my intro and I said, it's not for all of us. And, and you said, yeah, it is happening to all of us because all we hear from many of the influential people I've had on this podcast that study the microbiome and do nutrition studies and epidemiological work. It's all about eating the rainbow, not just five a day, but 30 a day, and include those wonderful spices that are feeding your second brain, your gut. So again, we get this 
cascade of mixed messages. And now you're telling us that's not doing us any good. So again, head on a swivel, you're just going, who's right? What well, I can, can I believe? You, they don't have long-term randomized controlled trials to prove this theory. It's strictly a theory that's gone viral. Ideas go viral and they're fads and it is a fad. The truth is in, <laughs> in the fact that it's a universal poison. And yes, there's a huge barn door of tolerance and how soon it's gonna to get to you and show up as symptoms is uh, very variable. They'll tell you that in all the literature, the primary hyperoxylaria literature, these children and people who are sick with a genetic disease of oxalate poisoning will die from it. And sometimes they have no symptoms except a little neck pain. And the neck pain shows up within four or five years of their death, their ultimate death. So you can have a disease and not have symptoms. You don't have a way based solely on symptoms to be sick with something. That's true with cancer and any other disease. So you can't say for sure what your tolerance is if it's a silent process underneath. The other problem is it may not be so silent. Who put together my inability to sleep? I was so tired. I didn't even know I couldn't sleep. I didn't know I had a sleep disorder. The lab showed I had a severe sleep disorder and no one's put together that it was from my sweet potatoes every night. I did not know that going to bed and having an attack of hiccups and belching at bedtime was a sign that the spinach Swiss chard or the Swiss chard and sweet potatoes in dinner was causing this electrolyte disturbance to my nerves and muscles, causing spastic responses in the diaphragm, creating all this belching and, and uh, hiccups. And then I go and read the literature and the literature says, hiccups are a late stage neurotoxicity that happens right before the rats die from star fruit poisoning. Oh, and it also happens to the humans who die from star fruit poisoning from oh, oxalates. Jesus. They end up with hiccups and then they're dead. Like I was doing that every night. I didn't have any idea that hiccups had anything to do with oxalates. But now that I've understood the effects on the electrolytes and the minerals, it makes total sense that the, the nerves and muscles would spasm when the electrolytes are off. If you have the wrong thing spasming, it could become arrhythmias, a heart attack or a stroke or other kinds of spasms too that aren't pretty. And people but may be dying- why aren't more people listening attack. to you? Sorry to interrupt, but why yeah. aren't more mainstream doctors, allopathic doctors saying, she's onto something. We should really be backing off the eat bucketfuls of spinach and almonds and this and that. And, and you know, showing people you're going to tell us about the low oxalate foods um, soon. But I mean, what sort of reaction do you get from mainstream medicine? People are worried that if we stop eating spinach and sweet potatoes, that suddenly we're just going to live on Kit Kats and and, and candy and garbage, like there's no other alternative and completely forgetting and not knowing, in fact, that our original diet, the diet of the hunter gatherer was built on animal foods. And the whole idea that saturated fat and cholesterol and meat is bad for us was never proven to be true. And it probably isn't true since humanity had to live so heavily on hunting animal foods for so long. And there's so many examples of communities like the Maasai or people who lived in Alaska living on an 80, 90% animal food diet and living robust, healthy lives under very difficult situations. They didn't have heating and air and comfy rugs. I mean, they're living on icebergs and on safari and, and they're doing well. So the I think the big problem is we're so biased against animal foods. We think if you don't eat spinach, sweet potatoes, and almonds, you're going to you're going to kill yourself on either too much steak or more likely too much cornflakes or these garbage foods that are in our diet. So that we need to just stop all the hysteria for a minute and so just relax and see, you know what, eating and expo exposing yourself to a toxin over and over and over again is harmful. Well, I guess it's difficult now because the dominant message is, of course, we have to stop murdering animals. And we all know that that the way we produce animals and they do suffer, we need to get across that in a more um, pronounced way. So getting back to the oxalates though, um, do, do you find, because you do consultancy work with this, I mean, tell me about some of the stories you get from the big middle years, people in their mid forties through seventies is what I call it. Because I wonder, because a lot of women end up at menopause going off work 
And it's all being put at the door of menopause when estrogen, when your sex hormones tank and creating a slew of problems. But might there also be when people are going off saying, I got a diagnosis from a functional medicine doctor of fibromyalgia, might there also be the oxalate overload that's that's putting them onto their sick bed or their sofa for the rest of the rest of their 50s and 60s? I have now become very convinced that this crash that women hit in their 40s and or sometimes you last to your 50s is probably predominantly oxalate doing that in the context of especially in the context of all these bad seed oils we're eating and just the high stress lives and of course women's lives are not simpatico with our nature you know having to be on a schedule the same schedule every day of the year running around with a career and running a house and raising kids and doing community work and like ridiculous like that's and being really isolated in the nuclear family. I mean, there's so many ways that women are being cheated of a really healthy life, but oxalates to me, women love their salads. Women love their vegetables. They're the ones experimenting with quinoa and buckwheat and gluten-free and dairy-free and all these high-risk diets that put you really heavily in harm's way. Men, I find my men clients, sometimes their kidneys don't fall apart until they hit 70, but they're often the kidney stone clients and their potato lovers. The women have always wanted their salads and their high oxalate foods. So women have a higher exposure to oxalates and it will be, I think at least, at least a third, if not most people with fibromyalgia, it's really an oxalate poisoning problem. Um, it, and I explain in my book the various mechanisms and how they overlay with each other that makes sense. And of course, I had fibromyalgia or the, the, the look of it and it just goes away. <laughs> You sound like you had everything. I mean, yeah. absolutely. A, a train wreck of autoimmune clustered attacks. I've yeah. had clients who are worse than me, really. I, I like, I have to witness tremendous suffering and shocking recoveries. People can be down to nothing in size or have had 15 abdominal surgeries or this and that, or incredible problems with bladder stones. An interesting part about this is the diversity of where it's showing up in terms of symptom and really what's breaking down. But what is really breaking down is thyroid function, sex hormone function, our fertility rates. These are all things that can be related to oxalate poisoning. And fundamentally, Gosh. no disease just shows up randomly. It's a product of some form of toxicity and some form of deficiency. Oxalate is great at doing both. It creates deficiencies of not just minerals, but minerals are enough. We don't even have to go past that. And a toxicity problem that, that is because of the mineral deficiency, like min, de, deficiency and toxicity ultimately can become the same thing. You can create a toxicity just through creating these deficiencies that causes the cells to fail, the mitochondria to fail. Your metabolism starts breaking down. That's a central, a central problem. And the reason we should be concerned about oxalate is because we know if you took the time to listen to your own science, we know we're eating past our capacity. And it's a universal problem because these foods are universal. So why not suspect the most obvious thing from a science point of view that something that you're eating that causes deficiency and toxicity, you're eating it all the time, should be on the radar of suspects. And certainly if you're sick, why would you keep eating something that creates deficiency and toxicity? Yeah. And we go back to the incredibly um, deafening decibel level of the messaging about, I mean, I was just reading today, I was looking at spinach, healthy spinach, and oh, rhapsodizing about the wonders of spinach, and we should all be having much more of it in our diets. And, you know, how many articles have we seen like that? How many Instagram posts about the, you know, orthodox dietitians, nutritionists who are proselytizing about what their textbook told them 10 years ago. They're not even looking into what's happening now. And, you know, I've had Prof Ben Bickman and Prof Tim Noakes on a couple of times. You know, I want to dig on the big middle. You have lifted the lid on something that is oh so important to all of us. We need to be aware. So I want to bring you down now to the practical level again. What are the swaps for the spinach and the Swiss chard. I know toxic superfoods, you've got a book coming out, and we're gonna talk about that, but uh, for now, just so people can take away some practical moves, what would the swaps be for, because you're not talking no oxalates, it doses the poison, what would you swap out for the spinach? 
and the Swiss chard. Romaine, romaine and other leaf lettuces, all the lettuces are very low in oxalate. So all those are fine. If you don't have an allergy to them, if you digest them well, they're nutritious and they're not toxic. So, you know, the lettuce is fine. All the greens are basically fine. Even kale is really low compared to Swiss chard and spinach. So some kales are a little higher than others and kale is much higher, is three times higher than spinach. I mean, pardon me, three times higher than lettuce. Lettuce and cabbage, really low. Kale, three times higher. As so you go from three to nine milligrams per serving or hundred grams versus something that's 10 or hundred times that in the spinach and Swiss chard. So don't worry about kale. Everyone thinks kale is high in oxalate. Not true. Same confusion with coffee and tea. Tea is pretty high in oxalate. Coffee doesn't have any oxalate. But there again, there's some bad supposed research out there because researchers think that dehydrated coffee crystals are eaten in, in gram amounts or eaten in like eight ounces of dehydrated crystals. No, no, no. When you use it, you use a gram of powder. Like this researchers don't have enough sense. So there's confusion about things like coffee, even coming from the literature. You have to put your head on straight in order to just think straight about something that has is a mess out there. So easy swaps, cauliflower, turnips, rutabaga, all much lower than potatoes. Instead of these pseudo grains like quinoa, buckwheat, and teff, have some rice, white rice. Wait, is quinoa high in oxalates? Very. Wow. Because that's the only grain I eat. I always think I'm being gained the poster girl for healthy eating when I'm having my quinoa with cubed sweet potato and some broccoli florets and maybe some mackerel on top. I always think there, I'm hitting everything. Great. The mackerel great. Berries. We love the fish. <laughs> hmm. Which is probably full of microplastics these days. <laughs> That's not the fish's fault. And no, exactly. There we are tying ourselves in knots. You know, personally, I, if I had to choose between microplastics and oxalate, I would take microplastics any day, even though, because my at least my body isn't going to absorb them as readily as it's absorbing this oxalic acid. Yeah. yeah. And the thing so, is, you mentioned with the boiling, thyroid stuff. Sorry. Boiling can help that broccoli. If you boil your broccoli, it'll help that. And then broccoli is fine. And if you have squash instead of the sweet potatoes, the butternut squash and the kabocha is a really nice one. But the winter squashes are a good swap out for the potatoes and the sweet potatoes. And, you know, actually refined grains are, are much lower, you know, the white bread versus the whole wheat because it's the brand that's high. Um, and then this the berries, you can have blueberries instead of blackberries. Yeah. And blueberries and raspberries are good. And that's what we're always, you know, Prof Tim notes that, yeah, just a few berries. That's what I have on a blob of Greek yogurt. And just I've been few. living that way for a long time. Yeah, just, just a few. few. That's the way berries used to be eaten. You'd walk down mm -hmm. a country lane. There's a few berries there. You have a few. You don't put piles of them in your morning, whatever, and live on them. Well, it's that old thing, isn't it? The dose is the poison. And we think spinach is fine. Just have that whole huge family-sized bag and throw it into your um, Nutribullet. Sorry, I keep dropping the brand name. I can't think of what else you could call that. Your well, mixer? We think, we think the more the better. And we think if we grind it down, we can force ourselves to eat more of it and forgetting to notice that it actually tastes kind of nasty. Maybe it's tasting mm. bad because your body's trying to tell you something. <laughs> well, I did want to tell you too, that when I had some gastroenterology tests, you know, it's all the bland foods. And he said exactly what you were saying. He said, no whole grain, anything. I want you to eat white rice, um, white overboiled chicken um, before this test for three days before it. And, you know, the kind of white bread that anyone who thinks of themselves as a conscientious eater would never buy, you know, you'd buy rye sourdough or something, but, you know, like one of those white bloomers. So, and that's what the gastroenterologist wants you to eat before they do the tests to see what's ailing you. So, so they can lower the inflammation in the gut. Mm. Yeah. Right. So they can really see what pathology is left over. And gastritis and gut destruction was long thought to be the major product of oxalate poisoning. Since 1840s, the original diagnosis always expected gut problems to be a central feature of the disease of oxalate poisoning from your food. So in your gut view, problems we... are universal now. Everybody's complaining about something. Absolutely. But, you know, again, it does get to be challenging. You have to become your own advocate, your own detective mm -hmm. to find your own path through all of these things. I mean, I, I still, I mean, I definitely think I probably have oxalate overload and I'm not obsessing about it, but I, I did. That was my go-to mountains of spinach every day. <laughs> I just 
there's no way. And I was, I was so thinking that I was doing everything right. And even now, if you listen to someone influential, a nutritionist on Instagram, and they're rhapsodizing in the same direction because they haven't moved along from their textbooks at all to take well, a wider view. Well, if you've view. already built your brand around your cookbook or your this or that and this message, if you if you spin and do a 180, then you lose your, your income. So they're stuck with their message, just like the fake vegans who keep being vegan because everybody will hate on them and they might get attacked. So they'll pretend they're still vegan because you can't change your tune. People are unforgiving of growth and learning <laughs> yeah. and want you to move on. And that's this part of psychology. We don't want people to change. We want something dependable and we want other people to be dependable for us and be a steady, a steady source of information or, or fantasy that we want to hold to. But it's really good that you didn't know quinoa was bad because if you took off quinoa and spinach all at the same time, it may be too an abrupt a change for the body, which in itself is disruptive because the body is really quite sick with oxalate overload and wants to be done with it and wants to get it out of the your thyroid gland and elsewhere. And you really don't want it to start doing that cleanup work too quickly. So it's, right. it's good to like learn one food at a time, learn to eat salad with romaine instead of spinach find something to chew wow. on instead of spinach smoothies all the time. And then yeah. well, I, what about watercress, rice? by the way, because I buy loads of quinoa, the only grain that I eat and watercress, but I have reverted to eating animal protein, lots of cheese, eggs. And like a lot of people that I know who've had, because I had a diagnosis as well at menopause. Of, well, it's more to do with the veganism and who knows, maybe the oxalate overload now that I'm learning uh, pernicious anemia. I mean, I just wasn't absorbing any nutrients whatsoever. So it was a real car crash at menopause. And I've always hung it on the tanking estrogen and progesterone, but um, multifactorial, all of these things. And we, we clearly need to become our own advocates and do our own digging and read. You've got a poster behind you. That's your new book coming out in just a couple of weeks, Toxic Superfoods. Yes, it is. Hopefully it's um, going to help people get a sense for this whole confusing story and give you some really practical tips with charts and so on. So it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it isn't that hard to give up spinach and, and even chocolate. There's other things to eat other than chocolate too. So the, and then just feeling better is such a nice reward. But then understanding that if you've done what it sounds like you've done, Susan, you may have a long tail recovery where it's pretty bumpy, where you, you feel good for a while, then you start having symptoms show up again as the body tries to heal it. It brings on inflammation attacks that can be really quite trying at times that come and go. And you need to know what's going on because you... You can actually slow that down by including oxalate in your diet. So if I have people go really low and they're feeling bad, I'm like, eat some olives, carrots, and a cup of tea, and you can get those symptoms to quit. So there's, it's not about zero oxalate. It's about knowing that generally our general diet is past what we can take. And if you don't want to end up in the dump when you hit 40, 50, 60, and beyond, you'd be wise now to not poison yourself in the meantime. So look at the lists too, which are found on your website, sallyknorton.com. And, and you can do the elimination tests as well. I mean, we can all do that. It's within our agency, within our power. We can just decide, okay, I'm going to give up all the high oxalate foods, which they will find listed on your website and in your book, which is available to pre-order. And I've already got my pre-order in, which is great. Yeah. And, um, and then see what happens. Because I know I was listening to one of the many YouTube videos you put up and there was a woman on there and she'd had a, so many, I kind of didn't believe it. She had, it's felt like three dozen autoimmune problems and chronic disease symptoms. And she was saying that after she gave up the spinach and two weeks later, she did a test and her ankles were swollen almost immediately after she ate a big plate of spinach. Now the body's responding to it with obvious symptoms. And that's what and, we need to decipher. And some people's body really will tell them that. And I have some theories I mentioned in the book about why that may be going on, where it seems like a sensitivity to oxalates is occurring. It's really fascinating stuff. And it, it your body isn't lying to you. If you get a response to something like that and you notice it, it's something to pay attention to. And, and you don't have to rely on an Instagram influencer to tell you what is or isn't so. 
work with your body, start to come into yourself, really respect your experience to the point where you get some confidence that you can come out with, you know, a better program for yourself. You don't have to be told what to eat all the time. And there's no genetic component to this, is there? A predisposition? There are genetic components in many ways. Like it's genetics that might affect how it shows up in you. I will never get kidney stones. I've been blowing oxalate through my kidneys so long, so heavily. And still after I do the diet, I'm cleaning out old oxalates. I never get kidney stones. That's genetics that allows me. And it's also probably I eat a... I've, I don't eat junk food. I, I eat a diet that does have minerals in it and isn't too acidic and so on. That's helping my kidneys. I get enough citric acid. That's very protective. Vitamin C or not vitamin C. Vitamin C turns into oxalate, by the way. That's another problem. But, oh, but lemon juice is really good for the kidneys. Um, so yeah, this, there's genetics will affect how quickly it wrecks your gut, how quickly it wrecks your kidneys or your heart or your liver or your vascular system or your thyroid gland or your hormones and your gonads. That's all, you know, some genetics. There's also some genetics in terms of this other physiology, which we don't have time to get into, but it doesn't mean that that some humans are impervious. It does mean that you might seem impervious until you hit 70, but then suddenly something happens and you find you're in renal failure or you're suddenly demented or suddenly sick and weak and have chronic fatigue and out of the blue, well, the body puts on a good- And no mainstream doctor would, would actually say you're leaching oxalates. No, no. It's not in our education if, and it's hard to test for. This is, it's not in medicine because medicine has chosen to codify diagnoses that they have a treatment for, meaning usually surgery or drugs, as we noted in with my feet, whatever they'll treat for becomes a legitimate disease. If they can't measure it and can't treat it, then it's not a legitimate disease. And none of them went to school to tell you or ask you about how much spinach you're eating all week. You know, they just, that's not why they went to school. So even if it's, if they could go past their education, which you're supposed to do as a professional, continue to learn and expand your understanding of what you do, it doesn't suit their MO. It does not suit how they yeah. want to practice. Yeah, there's no money in saying eat less spinach. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, um, I can't thank you enough. I've got some straggler questions and we could go on and on and on. I do want to ask though, omnivore, carnivore, what are you eating these days? I eat a meat heavy diet and I have reactions. One of the problems with oxalates is it gives you these sort of food reactions and intolerances and uh, immune problems and mast cell activation and so on. So I have a sort of, I have to pick and choose around my reactivity. So I feel good. I eat a lot of fish and pork and animal foods where I can. And I eat some plant foods, some fruits and some lemons here and there, but I have some plant foods rounding out what is a very carnivore looking diet, which is an interesting thing from someone who was vegetarian and vegan for uh, 16 years. <laughs> it's, it's, as you said earlier, classic story now. So many people are doing that and their health tanks, and then they have to go back like I did unwillingly, so reluctant to start eating meat again. And it's been really hard. It's been hard. You know, the dissonance in my head hurts sometimes. It's, you know, you have to be patient with yourself because the change on something you do every day is a really big deal. Where you shop, how you shop, how you put together meals, how you run your day, it affects every little piece of your daily rhythm. And one thing about the big middle is like, we like our daily rhythms. By the time we're middle-aged, we like a certain kind of routine <laughs> that keeps all the pieces to going. Our lives are complex by the time we're fully grown up. We've got houses to run, jobs and careers and children and parents and stuff going on. And we want to be fit and you have to fit it all in. And so we rely on our routines and your food is a major piece of those routines. And you start messing with yeah. the routines and you start getting kind of mad about it. Like this is adding, it's demanding a little more attention, a little more energy. And so the change can be hard. So I really suggest that people take their time, be patient with your change process. Know that you're changing whether you're noticing it or not, but please change in a healthier direction for your own sake. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And your, your website is a wealth of information before people can get their hands on your book. Again, the title is Toxic Superfoods and it's out on the 27th of December.
nutritionist Sally K. Norton, I can't thank you enough. You are a bright, shining light in what is increasingly a confusing, very murky world. And it's great to shine a light on oxalates and the anti-nutrients that the defense chemicals in plants are. I can't thank you enough for doing this. It's the start of learning even more about oxalates. Thank you so much, Susan. It's a delight. Absolute delight. And big hugs and thanks to Carrie, Stephen, William, and Robert, I noted your names, for your generous donations. I, it was like Christmas came early in the past couple of weeks. Really thank you, because The Big Middle is an indie podcast, and I've got no support. I, I've tried to keep it ad-free. We'll see how long that lasts. But thank you so much for listening and for watching. And hopefully, I'll have another one for you before Christmas. And for now, we'll say goodbye. Bye-bye, Sally. Bye, Susan. Cheers. Be well. And you. Bye-bye.